everyone. Thank you for coming. This is uh, Duck and Cover 2.0, how preparing for the end of the world can prepare you for anything. So I know a lot of you guys stopped by my booth. I'm going to try to hold this. We're going to see how this works. So my name is Joe Jones. I am affiliated with the Cold War Museum in Waukesha, and I also have my own uh, personal collection of civilian civil defense artifacts, which are displayed on a table in 102C, I believe. So if you haven't stopped by, please stop by. It's really, really cool. And uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to basically go over how you can apply what was learned in the Cold War through those civilian civil defense pamphlets to everyday things that you might encounter. And you're like, wow, that's really a stretch. Yeah, it kind of is, but you know, you guys will really enjoy it. So um, when I was creating this presentation two years ago, I had decided to not go over nuclear war, you know, if the bombs were to fall, because we were so far away from that, that I'm like, you know what, yeah, we really don't need to cover this. We can just go over the pamphlets and then um, go right into the meat of the presentation. So um, anyways, so we're gonna go over how to, describe, uh, how to survive a nuclear blast. Um, it's really relevant today. So step one, don't be under the bomb. There, we got it. So, but actually, um, before we go over how to actually survive a nuclear blast, and this will only be about 10 minutes, uh, we're going to go over um, kind of the nuclear threat that's going around today. So, uh, in the past when I've done this, it's been really hard to find updated graphics uh, going over stockpiles and going over um, what would actually happen in a nuclear war and thankfully or unthankfully uh, I now have updated graphs and charts. So what you're looking at right now is 2022. It is updated uh, nuclear weapons per country. So just to go into a little bit of background, one or 200 missiles could pretty much destroy the world. And when I say destroy the world, just plunge us into cold darkness, kick a bunch of stuff up into the atmosphere, just generally make it miserable for people. And so now you're seeing that um, America has about 5,400, Russia has about 5,900, we're not exactly sure of the numbers completely, and we're not exactly sure how many of them actually work. But um, it's pretty safe to say if everyone decided to shoot off everything at the same time, um, yeah, it's just not going to be fun. So getting a little bit more into the bombs, uh, we'll go through some of the uh, bombs that were some of the most devastating. So this is a nice graph from 2017. The two really little dots you see off to the right are um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And this is to scale. So you can see that the bombs get increasingly larger with the US firing one off in 1954 called B-41. And that was the most powerful one done by the US. And Russia kind of trumped us a little bit, called the Tsar Bomba. So has anyone ever heard of the Tsar Bomba? Oh, that's a fun one. So we're going to go into a little bit about what the Tsar Bomba actually did. So the flare was visible, and that's the nuclear flash. That was visible for 620 miles, and it was also observed in Norway, Greenland, and Alaska. The mushroom rose to a height of 42 miles, and the hat was, sorry, the hat was 50 mi uh, the diameter of the hat was 59 miles, and it was 43 miles, so it was two-tiered. That's a lot. That's really, really big. Uh, blast waves circled the globe three times. The sound wave, their seismic wave circled the globe three times. Glass shattered at about 480 miles away, and the sound that was generated by it reached so far they couldn't even um, imagine how far it was going to go. So the map there, you guys see the little red dot around here? That's where the bomb went off. And so they're seeing it in Greenland, and they're hearing it all over the place, and the waves traveled for three times around. It was pretty, pretty crazy. So how many of you guys out there, and men and women, of course, how many of you guys, 
How many of you guys deal with having to go someplace for your job? So something goes crazy and you actually have to go there and fix it. Probably a lot of you. Now, what would you say if 50% of the time you wouldn't come back from that and they would never see you again? You'd be like, well, this kind of sucks, right? Where do I sign up? <laughs> so the crews of the two planes that flew the Tsar Bomba, one of the planes was the one that actually carried it, and the other plane was there to observe it. They were given a 50% chance of survival, and they knew this going up. And they were given a 50% chance of survival, however, it was more like 20. <laughs> but they wanted to be nice and tell them it was 50. Thankfully, both crews survived, but the bomb was so large that this is between 26 and 40 miles away. The shockwave hit them, I believe the shockwave hit them at 36 miles, and it caused one of the planes to drop a mile because of how intense it was. They literally had to put a parachute on the bomb, so they had a chance of escaping its blast wave. Now, when I was searching for graphics on this, this one kept coming up, and I just had to include it. So it shows different bombs. It shows B-41. It shows the Tsar Bomba. And it also shows Earth going, here, hold my beer. And Krakatoa being 200 megatons to Tsar Bomba's 50. So I thought that was pretty cool. The anatomy of a nuclear explosion. So the bomb has been dropped. So now we're gonna quickly go over what exactly happens in the first few minute, uh, seconds and minutes of the bomb going off, because this is important to being prepared. So the first thing you'll end up seeing is the flash. The flash is very intense in all of the... My screen's off? Oh my gosh. <laughs> there we go. Okay, just tell me when I need to jiggle the cord. That's what you guys are all there for. So you're the ones who come. Yeah, you're the ones who come down and tell me to jiggle the cord, and then it'll start working. So okay. So the flash. Anytime you see a nuclear bomb go off in a movie, you'll see that it's a flash. Um, and some of the larger bombs, the flash can last. The flash can last up to a minute, but it's mostly intense in the first few seconds. So in those first few seconds, if you are unfortunate enough to be looking directly at it, you are going to be blind. Now, if you are looking in the general direction, the blindness could be permanent or temporary. It really depends. So the thing to do is, that's why one of the reasons why they say go into the shelter is because you want to avoid the flesh. And the next thing that comes is the radiation and the heat. This is almost concurrent with the flash. So when the bomb goes off, if you've seen any of the tests, you'll see that there's a flash and then everything starts to mushroom out and raise. That is because of the um, radiation and the heat. The radiation, there are two waves of radiation, the initial and then fallout. So the initial radiation comes directly from the bomb. That is the material that's exploding. The heat is the fire wave, it's the um, heat wave, and this is what causes a lot of the damage. So the heat wave within the first couple of miles is completely destructive. If you are outside, you are a smoking pile of ash. If you are in a building, you could possibly be a smoking pile of ash. It depends on how close you are to the explosion. The farther away you get out, the heat could be as simple as it stops at your clothing. So it really depends on how close you are. Two to, three, two to three miles, you're pretty crispy. Outside of that, you have a chance of surviving. So then the blast wave. So how many of you guys have seen this house get exploded? Everyone has seen this house get exploded. So what is hitting it is first, when you see the dust, that is the that is the um, initial explosion. So that is the radiation part, that is the heat. What you're seeing right now, this is the blast wave. So this is the blast wave hitting the house. So if you remember, it goes over the house and then it draws it back in. So this is a pretty good example of where you want to not be in a nuclear explosion. Uh, it initially travels over 2,000 miles per hour. It does decrease significantly the further out it goes. Um, 
In a five kiloton explosion, the blast wave destroys buildings within two to six miles. I know I put two to five, but it's two to five, two to six. And there's um, a better graph here that shows uh, possible blast effects of a five um, megaton blast. So if you see ground zero, you're just an afterthought. Somebody way far away is thinking, gosh, I hope they're okay, but they're not. Um, within two to three miles is total destruction. Severe damage comes between three and five. Moderate damage is between five and seven. That's usually where you can be outside and be okay. And then between seven and nine miles is light damage and anything after 10 is fine. So you're like, oh, okay, well, that doesn't sound too bad. That's a five megaton. So we're going to look at a 15 megaton bomb that just happens to be centered right where we are right now. So we will be that afterthought. We will be that, oh, I thought they were in Milwaukee. I hope they're okay. Um, so I know it's a very small graphic and I apologize, but right where we are is complete destruction. If you guys are familiar with the area, Waukesha, you guys are gonna be okay. Possibly. It depends if you're outside or not. But you can see just the massive destruction um, that takes place. So we wouldn't even know what hit us. And then Waukesha would see a bright white flash. Then there's one more round to make it through, and that's the radiation. So this is the fallout. So fallout happens when radioactive particles, dust that's been kicked up into the air, comes down. You need to be in your shelter. I like to tell everyone that you want to be in your shelter within 15 to 20 minutes. You are not experts. You have no idea where the bomb is coming from. So some people are like, oh, if it's 20 miles away, you have to do this. If it's 100 miles away, you've got five to six hours you're not going to want to take that chance. You see a flash, you give yourself 15 to 20 minutes to get to your shelter. So, how can you guys survive? So let me tell you, ever since this game came out, it's been really, really hard to find graphics online dealing with nuclear war and fallout. So I feel like I almost had to include it because it's, everybody loves it. So um, the way you survive is by being prepared. Um, being alert today means being alive tomorrow. So this is kind of where we get into the meat of the presentation. It's basically, how can you apply what you learn from Cold War pamphlets and being prepared to how you be prepared in your company today and in your future? So, Step one, one of the things that was touted in the Cold War pamphlets and by the government is getting to know your neighbors. So getting to know your neighbors, we're stronger in a group. And being stronger in a group means that you're more likely to survive if you have people you can lean on. So I picked a really, if you guys are familiar with this, this is the Twilight Zone. And this is the fallout shelter. So not exactly the best uh, example of neighbors, but I thought it was a really cool deep cut to put in there. But all these neighbors knew each other, so if something happens to a neighbor, what is your first thing? Your first thought is, how can I help them? So, how does this relate to work? Well, why on earth would you want to get to know your neighbors, or in this case, co your co-workers? So how many of you are IT? Cybersecurity, you know, Okay, so that's a fair amount of you. How many of you IT guys like working with your coworkers who are not IT? We've got one, bravo. So, I was in IT for a long time as well, and I, I didn't necessarily like dealing with the people who would call me every five minutes to reset their password because they forgot it again. I'm in tech support now, that's all I get called about. So, the reason why you want to get to know your coworkers is Betty from accounting, right? You go to the company party, you get to introduce yourself to Betty from accounting. She has three cats, did you know that? 
Mitzi, Flopsy, and Mopsy, right? And Flopsy's on medication, and Betty herself loves to watch The Bachelor on Thursday nights, and she also likes to knit and crochet. Would you like to see some of it? It seems pretty, like, ridiculous, right? I mean, some of the small talk that you have to do in getting to know your coworkers. But if Betty feels like she knows you, when Betty clicks on that email that she's not supposed to, and opens that file that she's not supposed to, if she has a rapport with you, she's more likely to tell you what she's just done. Oh my gosh, I think I've accidentally done something that I'm not supposed to, rather than close the laptop and go to lunch, right? So I know it seems, I know it's like, it's not, it's definitely not in my nature to go out and meet your coworkers, become friendly, make it a point to do that. But it really could save you some trouble down the road. If they feel like they know you, they feel like they can come to you. Step two is to create a plan. How many guys have to contingency plans for anything? It doesn't matter. Oh, that's not the same amount of hands I just raised when I asked if you guys worked in IT. <laughs> so, in the Cold War, creating a plan is what helped keep you safe. How many of you think that these pamphlets are going to save your life? How many of you think that these pamphlets will save your life? They could. They could. But what happens when you think you know what you're doing? You're less likely to what? Panic. Exactly. What happens when you panic? You drop the ball. How many of you guys have been in a really intense video game? Really intense, something to do with the video game. You completely forget what you're doing, and then you accidentally shoot yourself rather than shooting the person you're supposed to shoot. You button mash. You're like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, right? So the whole thing about the Cold War is if you have a plan, you're less likely to panic. So this little graph right here, the way the Cold War worked is the plan started with the individual. The individual learned everything. He got the information from the government. The individual learned everything. He taught it to his family. Then he had his neighbors to rely on. Then the local government, then the state government, then the federal government. But what is the most important part of that whole cycle? It's family and neighbors. How many of you guys remember Katrina? What happened with the federal government? It took them a very long time to respond. What happened to the state government? It took them slightly less longer to respond. Local government. Holy crap, we just got hit by a hurricane. We're going to do the best that we can. Where did the help come from? The individuals and the neighbors. So, civil defense, you had pamphlets. These pamphlets told you what to do. You memorize these pamphlets, and you know what to do. Any one of you could ask me, what are the steps to build a fallout shelter? What are the steps to stocking your shelter? What are the steps to creating a plan? I know, because I read everything on my table, and that's only like a tenth of my collection. There's way more at home that I just couldn't bring. I feel prepared. You could ask me in 2022, all this stuff from the 1950s, and I can tell you with certain confidence. Now, would it actually help me? Maybe. But at least I know what I'm doing. And if you know what you're doing, you can adapt. So, does that mean that you have to make pamphlets for your company? Absolutely not. No. No, you don't have to do pamphlets. But it's not a bad idea to let them know plans, to let them know your response plans. Now. We have to keep response plans confidential in some cases, but just giving them a general overview, step by step, if this happens, we'll do this, this, and we'll take care of it. If you have any questions, contact this person, this person, and this person. They know something's going on. Anytime the network goes down, I always am like, hey guys, what's up? You know, I wanna know what's going on. So your coworkers are less likely to freak out if they know that there's a plan in place. You guys are less likely to freak out if there's a plan in place. Even if the plan 
maybe covers half of what's going on, you still have a plan. And you're more likely to adapt and adapt to the issue. And we gotta add step 2.5 in here. Prepare for the worst. So all of these pamphlets were written by people who sat in a room and tried to figure out what would happen. How many of you guys take time to just figure out what would happen? So let me show you. This is one of my favorite pictures. Server fire. Ooh, that's no good, right? That's scary. So how do you prepare for the worst? My recommendation is 30 minutes a week. Literally put this into your calendar, 30 minutes a week. Think of an issue and think of how you would solve it. So it doesn't even have to be your issue. It could be, oh, I read about this happening to a different company. How would we solve it? Just plan for the worst. If you plan for the worst, you're prepared for anything. So don't be afraid to just be like, oh, okay, so if we get a ransomware attack, how are we going to respond to this? Or if our servers become crispy, how are we going to respond to that? Don't ever be afraid to just let your mind go and see, because you never know how it's going to benefit you. Um, I was reading, I do a lot of nonprofit consulting, and so this is when ransomware was brand new. I was consulting for a non well, it wasn't, it wasn't really well known. And I was consulting for a nonprofit, it was a really small nonprofit worth maybe about like $100,000. And they got hit with ransomware. And so like, I'm like, oh, you know, actually, I think I kind of know how to handle this. So we got them in touch with some people. I think they just ended up paying, but they lost everything. What they lost wasn't that important. It was like a donor database. So it was nothing like earth shattering. It didn't stop them from functioning. But like, I was like, oh, you know, I was just thinking about this ransomware. I read about it on the news. And then all of a sudden, like two weeks later, it hits this little, uh, little nonprofit in Iowa. Okay, so um, definitely think about issues. How would you solve them? It doesn't even need to be your game plan, but at least you have interaction with it. Have dedicated channels. So during the Cold War, do any of you remember 640 and 1240 radio stations? If you know old radios, you'll see those marked in red on the AM. So what the Cold War had is the Civil Defense had the Connell Rad stations. And so those stations were how you would convey information, how the government, both local, state, and national, would convey information. You can even get the reception in your shelters. You would tune to these channels. And once everything died down a bit, they would begin broadcasting, and they would begin broadcasting um, instructions. So how can you do this? Make sure that you have dedicated channels in your organization. So this would work two ways. Ways that people can contact you. Ways that you can contact other people. So if something happens, you want to push that information out. You don't want to be where, okay, well, the server's down. We don't know how long it's going to be down for, but we're not going to tell them anything. So, you know, even the littlest bit of information, yeah, so we're working on it. Okay, can I go get lunch? Oh, you definitely can get lunch. <laughs> so we'll, we'll probably be back up by the time you uh, get lunch, but... Don't be afraid to convey information and have those channels. Those channels are important. People are going to find their favorite channel to contact you. That's how they're going to contact you. I have this really annoying habit. We have a ticketing system, but I'll team my, teams my IT guy and be like, you know, does this really need a ticket or can I just tell you this? Like, that's my own little thing. That's my own little hang up. But um, they'll answer me. They'll be like, yeah, you should probably put a ticket in for that. Or, oh, it's broken? Try it again. I don't think it's broken. And magically it works. 
So you want to have those channels, and again, that goes back to knowing your neighbor, knowing your coworker, because they'll be able to contact you. But the information that you push out, and it can be as detailed or as vague as you want it to be, but throw them a bone, because that'll calm everyone. Now, you're going to be like, I don't understand how you're going to get this one to fit it. So create a shelter. The best way to survive a nuclear blast that didn't directly blast over you is to be in a shelter. There were lots of different shelters that you could make for any type of household. So you had shelters that were underground, you had shelters that were in your basement, you had shelters that you built in your basement, you had shelters that you built from out of your basement, and you even had municipal, it's going the right direction. You even have municipal shelters that could shelter between 200 and 1,000 people. Having a shelter was the most important thing. How many of you guys go camping and you're like, yeah, no tent? No, you need shelter. So that's the most important thing, especially during a nuclear event. It provides safety. So having a shelter means that you are safe, you are sound, you can zen, you can wait, you can wait everything out that you need to. You guys, and not just the IT people, everybody needs to create their own shelter. And by shelter, I mean this is a place that you can work, this is a place that you can come to, that you can get things done, that you can think. So my shelter is my basement, but it, that's just because it's a nice quiet place in the house. It's not because it's a fallout shelter. I do have one. But um, well, you can't be into what I'm into and not build one in your basement because it's fun. Um, but you want to go to that place. You want to have that place where everything could be chaotic around you but you can focus. I have my little zen happy place. Because when everything is going a little crazy, you guys are going to want that one spot that you can go to, even if it's for like five minutes, just to center yourself, to think about what's going on, to think about your very next step, and then to progress. So that is one of the most important things. Just like having a physical shelter is important, it is really, really important to have that place where you can go, even if it's to give yourself a short amount of time. And step five is to stock up. So stocking your fallout shelter is really, really important. So fallout shelters, the rule of thumb was, after the bombs fell, you wanted to stay in your fallout shelter for two weeks without having to come out at all. And so by staying in that shelter, you were able to live, eat, exist comfortably for at least two weeks. After the two week mark, the radiation would have decreased enough that you would be able to go out for short spurts. So you would be able to go out and get more food or you would be able to go out and get more supplies. You would come back, get decontaminated, and you would mainly live in your shelter for up to three or four months, depending on how bad it was. But the rule of thumb was you wanted to do two weeks. So seriously, stock up as, on as much as you can. How many of you guys were fully remote before the pandemic? That's really cool. How many of you guys had to go remote because of the pandemic? How fun was that? Oh my gosh, getting the computers that everyone needed. How many of you guys, it took a year to get computers? Just to get computers. My company, it took us about six to eight months to get computers for everyone. We were using our own. This seven-year-old machine right here, that's what I was using. Thank God I spent a lot of money on it when I first bought it. So um, pretend that it's a fallout shelter that you're stocking and you want to stock up. That's very important, especially for IT. Keep track of your equipment. Not only keep track of your equipment, keep track of the fail rate of your equipment. You want to keep track of that because you can see what fails so you know how much you want to have on hand. Those people that went fully remote, and if you supplied everybody with everything, that's 
mice, that's laptops, that's cords, that's cables, the kind of security that you needed, the programs that you needed, that was a lot of stuff. That was a lot of work, and you were forced into it. How many of you succeeded? I hope you all succeeded. You good? Okay, you good back there? Okay. <laughs> I hope you guys all succeeded at it, but it was hard to get the stuff. So knowing what you need and how much you need and how often you need it means that you can stock up. We're going through global shortages now. Oh, a, t a tanker coming out, one of those cargo ships coming across the Pacific, all that needs to do is tip over and you can't get in the certain USB cord that you need for four months now. So if you keep stock of the stuff on hand, you're able to better run your, <coughs> better run your departments. So it's, really, it's a really good idea to do that. It'll also cut down on time and it'll cut down on cost. How many of you have seen the prices rise? The prices are going up. It's ridiculous. I tried to get a replacement cord for this because I accidentally lost this. I found the one that I had because I wasn't going to pay $300 for a power cord. So that's what happens when the machine is seven years old. If anyone has a new computer, you know, you can just leave it up here and I'll take it and I'll give you mine. Um, but no, I'm just kidding. This thing's beautiful. I love it. But um, the prices go up, so you can cost save as well. So buying a cord now might help you, especially if you know you're not going to rotate through your machines or rotate through your equipment. How many of you have really old stuff? There were some power cords at a place that I worked at previous that I didn't even know, I had never seen before. There were some connection cords to monitors, and I'm like, I've never seen this pin combination before. This is way before my time. These were old. So if you have old stuff that you insist on using, make sure you're able to maintain that. So that's why you want to stock up. And the most important part, don't panic. You guys are all smart. You guys are great. You're in IT, it's perfect. Even if you're not in IT, you're still smart. You're here, you're seeing me at nine o'clock at night, it's great. Um, what you guys wanna do is you want to have plans in place. Make sure that everything is going well. Don't panic, even if it's not going well, because you know what? How many of you have come across a problem that you were never able to solve? Okay, yeah, all right, some of you. But for the most part, you're able to get through as much as you can when you really need to. And so if you don't panic, what happens? If you don't panic during the Cold War, you're more likely to survive. If you don't panic during a fallout event, you're more likely to survive. So if you don't panic while you're working, even if that dreaded ransomware comes up, you'll be able to go through it. You'll be able to survive, you'll do well. And that's the real reason for civil defense. Being prepared today means being alive tomorrow. So being prepared today for you guys means that you will be able to tackle anything that comes your way. Are you successful? Maybe yes, maybe no. But you'll be able to tackle it and you'll be able to do the best that you can do. So I apologize, this is really, really small. So basically it just goes over everything that I've gone over. So get to know your coworkers, create plans, let people know as much of the plans as you can, have dedicated channels of communication, Create a shelter, a place where you can go, relax, think, gather yourself, stock up on the things you may need to try to be ahead of the game, and don't panic, you got this. So, any questions? Yeah. So would uh, Indiana Jones have survived getting in that lead fridge like he did in that last horrible movie? Absolutely not. I mean, just... Just the PSI from how close he was would have just like exploded so him from the team. inside. No, I I um, um I got up and got popcorn at that <laughs> point. I just couldn't. I'm like, oh, if this is how the movie's gonna go, we're in trouble. So, but no, it was what he was way too close. What they showed was so the blast that the house came from that I showed you. They had set up a faux town to show the effects of the, of the nuclear destruction. And so Indiana Jones was in that town, essentially. And so where he was, he would not have survived. He would have died from the PSI, he would have died from the heat, and he would have died from embarrassment because it was just really poorly done. Any other questions? And it can be like about nuclear war too, what's up? Um, so on the community, uh 
involvement level. Um, how uh, how relevant is uh, ham radio infrastructure in that kind of scenario context? Yeah, uh, ham radio is going to save us all, honestly. That is in any disaster. How many of you rely on your phones for your news and your updates and your weather alerts? All right, how many of you are aware of how fragile the cellular system is? So, um, ham radio helped in Katrina. Ham radio helped in Sandy. Ham radio helps in blizzards. It helps in tornadoes. Um, storm chasers will often have ham radios with them. You can't, uh, any technology that you can carry on you, you cannot rely on because of just how the services are set up. The sun decides to fart out a solar flare, it could take out the whole system. What's going to take over for it? Ham radios. So it's very important. In the Cold War, I mean, in um, the monsters are due on Maple Street in the Twilight Zone, and I know I keep going back to the Twilight Zone, but they have a lot of Cold War stuff in it. One of the guys is a ham radio operator, and they're like, you're always in the basement working on your radio. Cold War is what really made ham radio operations like explode. So you had it at the advent of radio, so if you remember like 1930s, 1940s, when there was like War of the Worlds, that's when individual ham radios were really popular. That's when people began building their own ham radios, but the whole thing just took off in the 50s. During the uh, civil defense, like you had ham radio cores, and you still see a lot of that today. Yes? Any tips for survival when you're living in a high rise? Yeah, actually, I'm so glad you asked that. I know weird stuff like that. So in a high rise, <laughs> no, it's really bad. My husband's like, shut up, dude. Just like, I've heard enough about it. So funny enough, every time he goes to New York, I quiz him on in a high rise. So if you survive the initial explosion and you still have windows and you still have walls, um, you want to be in the center of the high rise or in the basement. So you don't want to be on the upper floors. That's where the radiation can settle and it can seep down. You don't want to be on the lower floor that's not a basement because that's where the um, radiation can also gather. So if you had a choice, the basement would be the best, but the center of the building would be um, better than nothing. And I quiz him every time he goes on a business trip. I'm like, all right, if a dirty bomb goes off, where are you going to want to be? And it's just like, know your shelters. He's like, oh, God. But uh, I'll be the one laughing when he survives. Yes? Um, just wondering, so after the two weeks, is there any recommended type of food that would after, actually be safe after a nuclear blast? Yeah, so you want sealed food. So you want sealed food that has not been touched by radiation. So you know radiation seeps into metal. Radiation can attach itself to metal. So you want to stay away from anything metallic. So like glass jars. Um, you want to stay away from produce that is grown in the ground after the event. But if it is just sitting out in the field, it's better than nothing. You just want to decontaminate it. So. Um, food that is in like supermarkets, so cans that are in supermarkets, as long as nothing is directly touching it, you should be fine. Your own food should be fine. And then anything that was already ripe should be okay. But again, it's like, you, there's better options, but if it's between starving, you're not gonna wanna starve. So you'll, you know, take your chances. Yes? How do they ensure that the radio system, you know, that you mentioned the AM radio station, sure. how do they ensure those kept operating after the event? Well, because with radio, um, the way radio works is anyone can basically set up a radio station that's ham operation. Now, I think with the 640 and 1240, I think that's one of those, hey, we're prepared. And we're probably going to get blown up, but we're prepared. But the good thing about that is they can boost signals. So anyone that survived, they could boost the signal enough to reach it. But it's more of you would be relying on ham radio operators who have access to 640 and 1240 because 
there's no guarantee that the radio isn't going to be hit. And where are your radio stations back then? They're in the cities. So, I mean, it's spotty at best, but we're pretty sure that some of the radio could have continued. But again, it goes back to that local, you know, the local ham operator is going to help you out. So you'll be able to pick up their bands. Yeah, uh, yeah so in the blue. How realistic is the movie The Day After and the movie Threats? The Day After is 100% realistic. So The Day After, if you guys have not seen The Day After, if you want to be horrified for the rest of your life, I recommend watching The Day After. It is um, a portrayal of Lawrence, Kansas, and what would happen should a full-out nuclear war happen. It is horrifying. I saw it in high school before Easter break once, and it was the most depressing Easter break I've ever had. Spring break, woo, no, I was like crying in a corner the whole time. But it really does show you the effects of nuclear war from before to many months after. And the thing about nuclear war leading up to nuclear war is everyone thinks you're gonna know about it. The day after is a more accurate portrayal. You just hear about little bits on the news. Oh, this country invaded this country. This country is moving things this way. Sound familiar? Yeah, it was pretty scary there for a while. Um, especially for me, I'm like, okay, I gotta get everything in the shelter now, it's not looking good. But no, it, it really, a, a, new, a full out nuclear war actually ramps up very slowly and then boom, it hits, one thing happens. So I would highly recommend checking it out. So yes, according to all the data that they had, it's 100% accurate. We have one in the back. Oh no. It's really late. You're expecting me to remember two parts? No, no, you can do two. Just do one at a time. All right. Um, water. Like, if, you, if your, your bathroom happened to be the center of your house, you were in a high rise in the middle, mm -hmm. and uh, that seemed like the best option, um, could you still wash your hands or shower, or would the water eventually come? Yeah. I wouldn't recommend doing any of that. You're going to want to save that to drink. So, you're going to save water to drink. Um, you can get water from many sources, what's left over in your pipes. It will get contaminated very quickly, so you'll want to try to get that out as soon as possible. Also, you could tap your hot water heater to get the water out of there, but water is the thing that you need the most, and so you are not going to want to shower. It's going to get really rank in the shelter, but you're not going to want to waste any of that for showering or anything. You're going to want to save that all for food. Um, you can see, you can use that space for other things, and you got a second part. Uh, yeah. So let's say Russian terrorists manage to hack, compromise a uh, nuclear reactor of some sort and cause a meltdown. Um, would that also have fallout, or would that just be radiation? It depends. So if it's if they hack it and it goes boom, then you're going to have a Chernobyl thing. Um, there's actually really no way that they could hack it in and not go boom, because what, are they just going to sit there and run the systems as normal? No, they're going to want to pull the rods out and stop the water from flowing. So yeah, no, it's basically going to go boom. You can forgive me, it's almost 10 o'clock. It's like an hour past my bedtime. So, um... Well, a good example is uh, Chernobyl, right? Yeah. It went boom, and, uh, you know, there was a contamination. Like, I, I was living in Germany, a kid at the time. Yeah. And I remember that we had a backyard with produce, like onions and stuff, and we had to trash everything. Yep, yeah, and, and they had to do that for about six to eight months afterwards because it took them that long to get the concrete sarcophagus on top of it. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, no, my bad. Now it's going to go boom. And then you got to figure out where it's going to go and how many of it goes. So Chernobyl, what many people don't realize is only part of Chernobyl stopped working. The rest of it's still working. Fukushima, only ha only that one reactor stopped working. The rest of it's still working. So these are functional. So if the entire plant goes up, it might be a really, really big problem. If only one part of it goes up, then it might be a Chernobyl thing where it's like, okay, we got to just get rid of everyone that is in the vicinity but it's relatively small as to how it could be. Yes? So, uh, you mentioned decontamination a, a few times. For somebody who's maybe not so prepared, what would the best method of like, decontamination 
Oh my gosh, a broom. I'm not even joking. So the way that you get ill from fallout is it could sit on your skin. You'll probably be okay. It's when you inhale it and ingest it. That's when the problem starts because then it just sits inside of you. So the best way to decontaminate and the way they would recommend is you want to get clothes that are pretty much covering as much of you as possible. And you want to go outside, do your thing, come back in, get brushed off in a neutral area before you enter the shelter, ditch your clothes that you were wearing, come into another neutral part. So think of it like an airlock, but you don't really have one. Come into another neutral part, get brushed off, and then come back in, dress, and that's how you decontaminate. You always wanna have something covering your face, any orifice, so like ears, nose, mouth. You wanna make sure that's all covered, and you wanna like stuff that could catch like hair, you wanna make sure that's covered. So yeah, that's how you would decontaminate. Comments on EMP? EMP, yes. Oh, see, that wasn't that big of a problem back in the 1950s and 60s, but it's a really big problem now. Just assume that all your technology is not going to work. It is, your cars aren't going to work, your phones aren't going to work, TV's not going to work. Unfortunately, the Nintendo Switch will probably be toast as well. So you want to make sure that um, you do have an analog radio. You want to, and, and that just goes for anything. Like I said, the sun could literally fart out a solar flare and the EMP could knock everything out. Highly unlikely, but that's that spending 30 minutes of thinking about the worst thing that could happen. So you just want to make sure, always have an analog radio, always have a way of getting information that is not directly reliant on technology. Yes? Was Three Mile Island really as bad as you claim it was, or was it just overblown? If Three Mile Island was really as bad as they claimed it would be, people wouldn't be able to be around it right now. Um, I think there was a real big push. See, nuclear weapons and nuclear facilities are two very different things, but a lot of people think nuclear is bad. Um, nuclear energy is some of the most efficient energy, but there was a push to make it all not good because it's like, oh, well, we've got all this nuclear waste. What are we going to do with it? Well, if we've had it for a while, we would be able to figure out what to do with it and we would be able to dispose of it. So it was bad, but I think it could have been a lot worse. All right, we got over there in the back. Uh, the Civil Defense Museum in Waukesha, is that open to the public? I work with them. Um, we actually don't have a spot. So we have the old Nike site, which is where we give tours out of, but like all of our collections, um, those are privately held. So um, we do give tours of the Nike site though. So we do do that. Um, you would contact us like on our Facebook page to arrange that. Um, but yeah, as far as we're, we're working on getting a site, we've got a lot of cool stuff. If you guys have been in the safe house, some of our stuff is in the safe house. It's really neat. Um, we've been pushing to get a museum. Um, I know my collection is available for people who want me to bring it wherever, so um, we're real cool like that. But yeah, so we are open to the public. It's just an uh, um, invite. You know, you would have to just contact us. So, all right. Yes? I think this might be a millennial question, but do you have a shopping list of like 10 most valuable items that you should add at home? Water. Water. Water is the hardest thing to get. It's the thing that you need the most. So I am never without a six week supply of water in my house. Drives my husband nuts. We have a wall of water bottles. Um, but the water is the most important thing. Water, peanut butter. No, seriously, you laugh. Peanut butter lasts forever. It's very high in calories. And so keeping a couple of really large jars of peanut butter could sustain you for three or four weeks. Not even joking. Because the human body, I think, at rest, at minimum, needs something like 900 to 1,000 calories to survive. And you can get that. Trust me, I'm a long distance runner. You can definitely get that from a couple of tablespoons of peanut butter uh, every couple of hours. So yeah, I recommend that. Um, radio, 
you want just an AM FM radio, just a regular AM FM radio. So really, that's only the few things that you need. Canned food um, is good to have as well, but like I said, you can do that with peanut butter. And um, now, this is a controversial thing, but something that makes you happy. A book, a book of puzzles, a deck of cards, something to keep your mind at ease. How many of you during quarantine, the walls were closing in on you? and it was awful, and you just wanted to get outside, or you wanted to do your favorite thing that you wanted to do. Now imagine being stuck in a shelter, knowing that the world is ending. You know, you want something that makes you happy. So if crossword puzzles make you happy, have a couple of those down there. If a certain board game makes you happy, have that down there. So yeah, it's really on an individual basis, but water, 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 water. Everyone in this room should have at least two weeks of water in their house. Because, like, think about the ice storm, the ice storm in Texas, and how people's pipes were freezing, and they weren't able to get water. Think of Katrina, how they weren't able to get water. Human, humans die within three days of not having water, and I think it's like two weeks of not having food. So water, water, water. All right, I think we have time for one more. In the back in the blue hat. That's you. Don't, don't use potassium iodide. You don't know what kind of isotope is in the bomb, and so it only works on specific isotopes. So, I mean, you could take it, I guess, if you want to, but um, yeah, it, you don't know. Same thing, um, if you were to give me a list of shelter supplies you wanted, like a dosimeter, a radiation detector, don't even bother. I mean, you're either gonna get it or you're not. You know, it's like if you're in a shelter and you're detecting radiation, well, I mean, you're pretty much screwed because that's your shelter. So um, it's cool to have. I have one. They're really neat to look at, but, you know, I don't recommend it. And I believe now, like, with the bombs, like, none of them use any of the isotopes that iodine would fix. If, if, if I remember correctly, that's kind of digging back in the brain there. So, all right, well, I'll be available for questions after this, but thank you guys for sitting through this really weird, interesting little thing that I put together.